in my steam engine playroom part 3. This is my second workshop and it is where I have a modest collection of model steam engines. The engine on the bench is a Willesco D20 steam plant which I recently bought. And it's time for a live steam test. Here's a health and safety warning. Whenever you run miniature steam engines, even toys like this indoors, always open the windows. You must have plenty of ventilation. Sometimes gas burners will give off carbon monoxide and you really don't want to be breathing this in. I'm not quite sure about these solid fuel tablets, but I'm taking no chances. Here is the Willesco D20 steam plant and it's quite a bit larger than some of the other ones I've seen. If you're thinking of getting into model steam, I think this is a good way to start because it's a simple machine. The steam plant is a good physical size, it's not too small. It runs at a very low pressure so it's relatively safe. It's a million miles away from a coal-fired steam plant but really a beginner should start with something other than a coal-fired steam plant. Solid fuel tablets in a tray can be removed and gas can be turned off but coal, once it's burning in a firebox, is an entirely different matter. These small steam toys get very hot, more than hot enough to burn your fingers, but because they run on low pressure steam, round about 15 pounds per square inch, the steam temperature is much less than a steam plant or any kind of steam model running at 80 to 100 pounds per square inch. The higher the pressure, the higher the temperature. The principles are identical on the small ones to the larger ones, but the management of them is very different. If you want to get into miniature steam, treat yourself, buy something like this first. I started off when I was a child with the smallest possible Mamod steam engine. I have to admit that small steam toys are really not my thing. This one being the exception, it looks quite good. Mechanically, it is far better than a Mamod steam engine in my opinion. It has an inline lubricator and even slip eccentric reverse. I'm not often confused, but I was a bit confused by the safety valve weight on the whistle valve. This is the safety valve that I'm unscrewing currently. The other fancy bit with the weight on the whistle is just the whistle valve. You lift it to blow the whistle. I'm a bit confused because in the old days they used to have hanging weights on safety valves, but that's not the case. This Willesco D20, as I bought it, was a bit dirty. It has its original box with the packing, the instructions, and also included in the box are some Esbit solid fuel tablets. That name takes me back. I filled the boiler using some spring water. I have a lot of this. I like drinking it. Here I'm withdrawing the fuel tray. I'm not going to use the old Esbit tablets. I don't know what they'd be like after so many years. Recently, when I was doing some work on an old Mamod steam wagon, I bought some of these. These are waxed solid fuel tablets. Why are they waxed, I don't know, but they seem to work okay. And four of these fuel tablets fit perfectly in the burner tray. All I need to do now is light them. With this feeble gas lighter that, to be honest, does need refilling with gas, these fuel tablets do not burst into flame readily, which I suppose is a good thing. When you get them hot enough though, they do start to burn, and they burn quite cleanly. Now it's time to quickly fit the burner tray into the holder underneath the boiler. I don't know whether you're supposed to light these when they're in the burner under the boiler. If you do the job as I've just shown it, and insert the burner tray slowly, you run the risk of melting the hand wheel. With all of the fuel tablets lit, and the burner tray safely under the boiler, all I have to do now is just sit and watch it until the water boils. What do they say? A watch kettle never boils. Well, this is not strictly true. This didn't take long before I had some steam pressure. While I was waiting for some steam to appear, I thought it would be a good idea to fill the inline oiler on the steam pipe, which lubricates the slide valve and the piston, and then I also oiled any moving part that I could see. I didn't fill the inline lubricator with thick steam oil, I just used the general lubricating oil, and I must mention that this is a good bit thicker than normal machine oil. This is genuine steam engine lubricating oil, I buy it from a company called Hallett Oils, and it's perfect for lubricating the bearings on steam engines. When I remember, I usually add a small amount of rapeseed oil to the lubricating oil in the can. This stuff is also called canola oil, 
and it's a friction inhibitor. In no time at all, the water inside the boiler started to boil. On this model, the exhaust pipe does not go up the chimney, which is a good thing. Instead, the exhaust condensate collects in the red plastic tray. As soon as I open the steam valve, the engine bursts into life, and it runs very well indeed. I do prefer this method of collecting the exhaust condensate because you can get rid of it with a piece of kitchen roll. If the exhaust goes up the chimney without a condenser, you get condensate all over the base plate. The engine runs very well at all speeds, and in both directions, depending which way you turn the flywheel as you open the steam valve. This part of the video is running at a quarter normal speed. Everything seems to be fine, apart from the pressure gauge, or manometer. And this is a bit sticky, I'll take it apart and see if I can free it off. This is how the whistle valve works. When I first screwed the fittings onto the boiler, I was a bit puzzled by this arrangement, but I understand it now. No matter how many times I tap the manometer, the needle does not move up to where it should be. I'm going to stop talking for a while, mainly because I've not got a lot to say about this engine. It just works and it's quite entertaining. With this type of water gauge, you can clearly see what's going on inside the boiler, and what I noticed was the bubbles on top of the water were small when the pressure was high, but when I ran the engine, we got a lot bigger. The bubbles were being compressed by the steam pressure. This is about halfway through the steam test. The fuel tablets had burnt away, so I replaced them, relit the new ones, and refitted the burner, but I didn't need to refill the boiler. I was surprised at the economy of water going on here. When I run the engine at a high speed, you can see that the bubbles in the boiler get a lot bigger. So I think it's what I said. The more pressure in the boiler, the more compressed the bubbles are, therefore the smaller they are. The less pressure in the boiler, the larger the bubbles. And this happens in all boilers, I would think. In this demonstration, I'm showing the direct relationship between the size of the bubbles and the speed of the engine which of course, the faster it goes, the more it depletes the steam pressure in the boiler. Look at the size of bubbles here when the engine's running at warp speed. Even though the water level in the boiler is still OK, I removed the burner. And not unsurprisingly, the engine got slower and slower and then stopped. I really have enjoyed having a play with this. 
I don't think I'm ever going to grow up. I started to drain the boiler, but then realised that the drain valve seemed to be blocked with lime scale. It did eventually drain, but it took ages. And originally, inside the boiler, I could see the lime scale and spider webs. I think it's time to buy some kettle descaler. I'll show the descaling process when I do it. But that's it for now. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.